very much and uh, welcome and thanks to Fosters for again uh, hosting this event. Um, there are a lot of downsides of course to the whole uh, education agenda, not least of which pressures on students from uplifted tuition fees. So it's a huge pleasure actually to be able to deal with some of the great positives and we have in our folio in education uh, some really remarkable scholarships and the Foster Travelling Scholarship is certainly one of them. And it's been running since 2007 and it was created very much in the spirit of Lord Foster's own experience as a student of architecture. Now if you think about the, the aspect of travelling in enriching the student of architecture's understanding of the subject, um, actually you'll, you're dealing with an incredible historical continuum. Uh, you can include in amongst that experience that Lord Foster had, uh, Pyrenees, Corbusier, uh, Calm, Certainly as a student of architecture, I was leafing through Kahn's sketchbooks from the Greek islands, from among other places, and you can see in those early sketches the provenance for much of the later work, the, the, the interest in mass, the interest in, in, in a kind of rather visceral, almost primeval uh, geometry and form. So there's absolutely no doubt that uh, the experience of travel uh, it's not just about coining the cliches, it's about broadening the mind. It's actually about informing the discipline. It's about um, contributing to the professional person. And thanks to the generosity and support of Lord Foster and Foster and Partners, the scholarships now supported seven students from the University of Bath, from Edinburgh School of Architecture and Landscape Architecture, from Risby College of Architecture in Mumbai, the Scott Sutherland School of Architecture at the Robert Gordon University in Aberdeen, uh, the University del Bio Bio in Chile, and the Bartlett uh, University College of London. So uh, all the howls of anguish from uh, both schools of architecture and the profession about the RIBA only being interested in London centricity are well and truly confounded by the fabulously international nature of the winners of this particular scholarship. This is properly international. Uh, Thomas Aquilina completed his uh, part one at Isala. Isala sounds rather like something bacterial, but of course it is the Edinburgh <laughs> School of Architecture and Landscape Architecture. Um, and he's, he's been known to us, in fact, for a little while because he's been a student writer of the RIBA student newsletter for the last couple of years. And we're really delighted to welcome him tonight as the 2012 recipient of the RIBA Norman Foster Travelling Scholarship. And he received the scholarship in 2012 for a project entitled Material Economies, Recycling Practices in Informal Settlements Along African Longitude and 30 Degrees East. This is about addressing recycling in informal African settlements. And rather than looking at informality in settlements as a problem, Thomas aimed to look at it as being entirely inspirational, that the informality could achieve efficient entrepreneurial practices of recycling. So the project aims to explore and learn from the material economies of the African city. And for those of us as old as myself who were brought up on the idea of elegant cities uh, composed by people like Hausmann and Nash and God help us El Speer, uh, the fact is that the informal city is in fact going to become the standard for all cities above 25 million people in the next 25 years. 50% of world settlement in the next two decades is likely to be informal, unlicensed, <coughs> built without the standard consents that we're so used to in Western European architectural practice. So to emphasize the criticality of accepting and understanding the informal city as an alternative model uh, is a real achievement. It's not something which in architecture and in architect practice, we readily do. We're visual hygienists. We're constantly trying to tidy things up. So Thomas's great achievement with this project is accepting the informality as something which can be learnt from and developed. The presentation, Material Economies, Critical Reflections, Informal Recycling in Six Popular African Cities, 
gives us an overview of his research and travel experiences. My view is that the best students never shrink from asking the biggest questions, and Thomas Aquilina is no exception. <coughs> Thomas. Thank you so much. Thank you, David. And good evening, everyone. Undergraduate critiques cannot prepare you for this kind of audience. It is indeed a rare privilege to be here and to speak to you today. I am grateful to Lord Foster and all members of the judging panel, of whom Sarah Ixjoka is here today. I also want to thank uh, Sarah Simkin and Katie Harris from Foster and Partners, uh, Hayley Russell and Jean-Paul Nunez from the RIBA for their continued support. As well, I have some familiar faces in the audience. Thank you, and thank you all very much. Architecture, as my first year tutor told me, is everywhere, but not everyone notices. Since then, I have been motivated by an everyday experience of architecture that finds extraordinary moments in the city. Buildings can sometimes produce these sorts of moments. Two years ago, I traveled to Nairobi. I was there working for the Uni United Nations. I was at UN Habitat, based at their headquarters. And traveling to the African continent then broadened my perspective on the role of architecture in everyday life. In Nairobi, those moments may be less visible, especially in settlements usually termed slums. Where buildings are informal, it is the use and experience of a space that is just as extraordinary. I cannot be as interested in the design and built form as in the very people who inhabit these spaces. This experience, together with other visits to Africa, had encouraged me to apply for the RABA Norman Foster Travelling Scholarship, which, as you know, is awarded to one student to a location and a topic of their choice. My winning proposal was to travel along a longitude, longitude 30 degrees east, through Africa to look at recycled materials. And I've just returned from this long trip, spending from this long trip across six cities, spending six months. I went to Cairo, Addis Abeba, Kampala, Kigali, Lusaka, and Johannesburg. And for the next few minutes, I will share with you my original intent, some research methods, and uh, some insights from the field. We will journey to these places, encounter their people, and discover some peculiar material things. I want us to see these photographs as perhaps powerful subjects, but I want us to look at what happens in the background of these photographs, in the background of these cities. Now this photograph was taken four years ago, whilst I was in Rwanda with university colleagues. We were working on a grassroots project. And when we walked through the city, through the capital city of Kigali, Locals would see us and they would shout out to us, Hey, Muzungu, which translates from Swahili to mean a white person. But when, <laughs> but when the locals would catch sight of me, they'd hesitate for a moment. <laughs> and they'd say, Hey, Obama. <laughs> <laughs> this would happen almost every day back then. But on this most recent journey, I was referred to the president only a handful of times. <laughs> this anecdote refers to the title of this talk, Recycling in the Popular African City. This is a journey about what's prevalent in cities such as Kampala and Kigali. Not necessarily popular as we may imagine it, the popularity of a president but popular in a different kind of sense. In this African city, perhaps, 
perhaps popular suggests where people actually are and live. And so perhaps popular can be an alternative to the term slum. Originally, my journey was defined by that precise line that would give me reason for stopping in certain cities and, char and chart essentially a long section across the continent. I expected the physical locations and layouts to be significantly different. And in turn, I thought the materials would change and be adopted and reappropriated along this line. I also expected to find materials that were implausible, the vernacular materials and the ways of recycling that could almost be unimaginable. Now, whilst I remained on this vertical line, the materials were anything but outrageous. They were ordinary. It was not about the aesthetics of materials, but about how these things are transforming everyday life and producing specific moments of organization. The scale of the continent may have anchored my project, but diversions on the ground and local experiences were all the more productive. These were at a micro and nano scale. The travel itself was intended to be 12 weeks, spending two weeks in each city. In the end, I was there for six months. At first, I prepared a meticulous, uh, a meticulous scenario for each destination. I even started to have an Excel spreadsheet for people and organizations and settlements that I would visit. But I quickly realized that actually I should arrive and carry no preemptive ideas, that I could find my way by chance encounters and engagements with people on the ground. This offered me a much more angled perspective and an intimate understanding of their place. My spreadsheet remains incomplete, but this journey became much more than that line. I traveled consciously. I traveled consciously, keeping in mind the attitudes that served me well as an undergraduate. Persistence and curiosity. I learned to go with the flow moving as I could as the popular economies exchanged and transferred, sometimes surfacing at the local crowded market, or the city square, or the local footbridge, or the curbside barbershop. I traveled to the popular quarters, often on the edges of the city, built of incomplete and fragile structures. These buildings became merely the background for people to organize and arrange their everyday activities and scenarios. People were involved in all kinds of economies that claimed and negotiated space. Established structures and their respective functions were outstripped by another kind of operating, another kind of using the city. I traveled by following the life of a material in each city, which took different turns and different directions and each of these materials were in some way recycled, specific to their location, and part of an informal livelihood. The city market and the city square were seemingly at the center of most operations. Mobile economies proliferated, whether they were cellular money transfers or vendors on the front line in Tahir Square. In Cairo, the found material was the precious copper elements on circuit boards in discarded smartphones. The value of the object shifted according to where it was in the city. Whilst I was there, phones were being assembled, gathered, and dismantled. Since I left, the metal has been sold again. In Addis Abeba, a ubiquitous construction site fence that is erected as a directive from the government and always painted in this yellow and green pattern. This fence is already becoming a appropriate popular roof material in the city. <laughs> and in Kampala, a vendor's chart box refashioned out of old cardboard packaging. The chart, once 
package motorcycles and it now serves as a selling tray. In Kigali, where plastic carrier bags are outlawed, people are remaking paper envelopes from throwaway things, such as cement bags. In Lusaka, a hybrid wheelbarrow assembled from an old car tire and an old oil drum as the dish. This makes an in inexpensive uh, luggage transport in the city. In Johannesburg, an iron and board frame that is used as the stand and steering device for vendor operations. People use this ambiguous space between private and public, unofficial and official, to find work. And the example of the chart box in Kampala perhaps best encapsulates my project. I've just finished a film. Cool. What's this called? Chat. 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 Hey, what's that mean? How big is your chart box? This one of four inches. The same four inches, four inches. I'm a vendor. Vendor? Yeah. Nice. <laughs> How many years have you been here? Here? Yeah. Like four years. Four years? Yes. And before? I was schooling. Now, this day, I'm already here. And ten years ago, where were you ten years ago? There, yeah, in the front there. I was there, front there, sitting down there. And the KCCA, did they trouble you? Yeah. Uh -huh. That's what I'm doing. They leave you with the chart and they take everything inside. Ah, everything. How much? Come on, how much? I'll buy this one. I'll buy this one. I'll buy this one. I filmed this with uh, two filmmakers from Uganda. And whilst filming in the taxi park, a vendor came up to us called Richard. And he said to me, uh, this chart you see here has given me four wives and six children. <laughs> uh, this minute scale operation gave Richard a means and a means to participate with the city, albeit modestly. I'm interested in the, in the resilience of urban residency in Africa, and with it, the possibility. Working in unfamiliar environments is challenging, but my field methods were straightforward. Interviews with local people, street photographs, and the distribution of disposable cameras to residents. I carried these cameras with me in my rucksack everywhere I went. And when good rapport with a resident was established, I would ask politely if they could take some photographs of their everyday journey in the city. First, I used this method to get a foothold in the city and to locate potential recycled materials. And this would include the people I encountered almost immediately, taxi drivers, shoemakers. In the second example, 
it was to probe further into this select object, finding out where it came from and where it was going. And the people here were always part of this material network. For example, taxi driver Adane in Addis Ababa, who drove this immaculately kept Russian Lada taxi. Adane shot a typical drive through the city. And here he captured this green and yellow fence. His journey was located between the old town and the new town. But his photographs, like all other disposable that, disposables that came back to me, provided a clue for my project. I would examine the photographs with the resident, and we'd usually find an object or material somewhere in the background of these images. In Lusaka, this vendor, James, was selling headsets outside the city market. He accepted the camera without hesitation. But a couple of hours later, I received a text message from James. It read, Thomas, what's your mission? So I responded, well, James, I'm just a student doing some research. Your photographs will help my project. His reply, I thought you were a spy. <laughs> Welcome to Zambia. <laughs> I met all kinds of people. I met all kinds of people. These, this is one of James's photographs. And it shows here, in, on the left-hand side, the sort of wheelbarrow that was across the city, always downtown in Lusaka. This improvised handcart recycles a heavyweight car tire and this oil drum to make the body. And it's a useful service to move between taxi park and market. The cab tends to transport charcoal, groceries, and mattresses. And it's locally known as Zam Cab. I've seen in these cities the habitat of dealing with difficult things. I've seen in these cities the capacity to survive for people like Adane, Richard, and James is often based on a saturated life. I've seen in these cities people contribute, divide the spoils, quick to fill in and substitute, and make up for established relations. Life is grounded. It often takes place on the street, where conversations and networks can be shared. The informal dimension of these cities is the popular architecture. Whilst no space can be liberating, it offers a place where active participants can gain momentum for the public to see. For example, in Tahir Square. Now this scholarship has provided me with an informal education, um, complementary to my undergraduate degree, and will be very informative for the next part of my training. It has allowed me to step into an unknown territory and take a risk into a new field. The scholarship, now in its seventh edition, has traveled to different places, different continents and different cities, but shows a world often connected. And I believe almost fundamentally that these places and these cities are important and a critical subject not necessarily as a process of accelerated urbanization, but because they offer a radically different way of being. Since traveling, it has become clear to me that these cities are going somewhere, but they are also always on the point of turning, turning into something else. I learned that life can be about the tiny things and small victories. I learned how to negotiate hazardous traffic, to negotiate political demonstrations, to negotiate fast-talking street hustlers. I learned to haggle resolutely <coughs> over the price of everything, always asserting that my old presidential appearance should warrant me a credible African price. 
Thank you very much. Thank you. This was absolutely stunning. Um, I, I remember one of my old degree tutors, who was one of the old Arthur Graham law, uh, when berating students who hadn't actually produced anything, he said, all you've given us is the soundtrack, and I want to see the movie. Well, we got soundtrack and movie here. Um, and I, actually, I, I didn't know whether to listen or to look or both. It's extraordinary. First of all, your prose is absolutely exquisite. It's got, it's got a character which keeps you on the edge of your seat waiting for the next word. Beautifully composed, really. Um, it's easy, I think, to um, romanticise uh, the very, very toughness of the life, lives that have been lived here and uh, the saturation of colour that the sun grace gracefully and freely provides in every shot that you've taken, which I think is something else. But um, it brings home all the messages, I think, about waste uh, in the West. I think it brings home the fact that actually we have lost a technical imagination somehow that allows us to improvise solutions from, frankly, very often next to nothing, which we saw time and time again in, your, in, in all the people that you've met. They, they had stunning uh, solutions which were technically perfect um, and which were recycling an element of something in ways that are unimaginable. I think we've lost that capability in some ways. Um, so there are so many object lessons here. Uh, but uh, let's take some questions from the floor. Well, I do have a question. First of all, I thought it was absolutely stunning as well. And what, what I'm about to ask you is because um, I'm, it's not a criticism. I'm interested to know if you can push your argument even further. Is that um, I was left wondering, this is, this is a culture that's much poorer than the culture we live in, and they don't have a role for an architect. They are self-architects. Mm -hmm. And so um, it's very inspiring what they're doing. But if we always are taking 15 steps back to a place where we're not now, um, where is the role of an architect then in that? Or do you think that the role of the architect itself is something that's going to become more intrinsic to us all? And is it going to be perhaps the great what we used to call the great white hope of the artist, you know, and perhaps we're all a bit more artistic than we used to be. We used to have these 15 people that were, could exhibit at the Royal Academy. Or perhaps we're not going to have these 15 architects who are at the top of the, the great Western canon of architecture. Perhaps that's what I'm okay, yeah. It's a very big question. It's a very big question. I think there's a, a place for architects here, and Throughout my travels, I collaborated often with the universities in these cities. Um, and so I spent a lot of time with architecture students and architecture uh, academics in these uh, African cities and, and institutions. And I would ask almost the same question. And most of the time, the kind of answers I had back were, yes, there's a place for us, but it's a very different place to the kinds of architects that they even spend their time researching and looking into is the same architects that I did whilst as an undergraduate. Um, and so there's a shift in role there. And I think you're right, there's a more active, uh, that people will play a more active participatory role in designing their own city. Um, and these are some examples where perhaps these moments of almost creativity show faint possibilities and unplanned openings that, that kind of uh, design the city in some way. I, I, but I don't think there will be this same, I mean, at least not here, in these six examples, the role of the architect as we know it will be, will be perhaps um, very productive. And I think there needs to be some kind of engagement. Um, and I found so I found when I was working at the UN the United Nations two years ago, I was very detached. And I wonder if that detachment almost is reminiscent of the architect, this almost view from above. Whereas perhaps this kind of travel, which wanted to radically explode this romantic image that we have, is that if you're, from, if you're on the ground and from below, perhaps then you can 
begin to realize the kinds of um, moments of organization, moments of agency that these people have, and then you can learn from that. And I think then take that into your architecture. Unfortunately, the architecture at the moment in a lot of these places is only trying to make an effort to, to, uh, to replicate what they see in Europe and America. So if anything, there's a, an even greater divide and discrepancy. Um, I don't know, does that answer your question? It's brilliant, the answer. Thank you very much. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. Uh, my question is not the I'm just wondering, what was your favorite example of uh, recycling that we see? Okay. Um, so my favorite would be the Zam Cab, which was that uh, hybrid wheelbarrow that we saw in Lusaka in Zambia. I partly liked the name, Zam Cab. I thought it was brilliant and, and very local. Um, it was all assembled. It was kind of the perfect example that you had it all assembled from recycled car tires, from the recycled oil drums. The rods would be found randomly in the city to make the, um, the, uh, the, the held parts, um, handles, thanks. And, uh, <laughs> thanks, Pa. And, uh, <laughs> but whilst that was such a good example, I thought in Addis Ababa, it was much more um, uh, subtle although obvious, because the entire city now is green and yellow. Uh, every open space across Addis Ababa is covered in these green and yellow fences. And you'd almost not rec you would almost um, just, they, they wouldn't even catch your attention. But when I would see all these photographs always showing green and yellow, and when the resident would take a photograph of their siblings, yet there's a green and yellow backdrop. Or when they're photographing the new construction site, and at the bottom you have this sort of uh, small line, again colored in green and yellow. I, I got quite interested in that. And so that became, I suppose, a lot more speculative, because as well, um, it's not as obviously recycled. Um, it's something that perhaps will be reused quite Quite, uh, quite significantly. So those two examples, I think Addis Ababa with this fence, and then Lusaka with the Zam cab. Um, and so what I was really interested in in Addis Ababa was that this fence almost, uh, almost gave, and by the way, Paolo, who's here, I collaborated with Paolo um, in, in Addis Ababa, who's a photographer, and it's great to have him here because he, he journeyed with me. And, uh, and we found, um, that this fence was, in a way, demarcating the popular areas. And there's a current drive from the government to shift these popular spaces to the edge of the city, where you have newly built condominiums that are supposedly that kind of architecture that will house these residents. Um, and so you could, you could almost draw out where people used to live or where people once were, these popular areas, downtown and the city, because this fence um, sort of marks it out. And so we then go to the condominiums, and where people always talk about we have uh, um, more space, uh, we have good sanitation, that's useful in some ways. But when we really probed and got into some of the finer details, we found that actually the mobile network on the edge of the city wasn't working. So where the people were previously brokers and always agents, they couldn't continue that kind of realm of work. Um, they had lost their social network, which as I mentioned before, was always grounded. And here they were living in a, living in a eight story a condominium block. And so for them to climb this staircase was, incredibly different and, 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 uh, and it became quite fractious in the city. And so this fence I thought was, was quite unique and especially because it, it sort of, uh, it wasn't as obvious as perhaps the, the Zam cap. Thanks. Thanks for your presentation. Thank you. I was curious to know what, after six months and having the time to absorb it, what, <coughs> what new questions 
it's raised in your mind that you would like to pursue in your future studies and work? So I'd like to think about how this could be a design project. Um, I think there is, an, there is material here that can be uh, transferred across into some kind of drawn design. And I don't know what scale that is at, but that's the sort of question I'm asking now. Initially, I was interested in that much larger scale, the continental scale, but then when in the city, I would sort of draw into the nano details. So the detail of perhaps um, in, in Kigali, where, as I mentioned, the plastic bags are completely outlawed. So everyone has to use paper bags to carry their stuff. And, uh, and so there's a real detail to that, because what do people use to make or refashion this, uh, this material? Um, so scale is quite interesting to me. Um, and how can that be thought through a design project? So that's one thing I, I'm really interested in. Um, I have a bit of time now because uh, I've been invited to present at Archie Africa, which is a um, conference in, Nairo in, 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 uh, in Lagos in December. So I'll try to use this time now to think about these questions. Um, yeah, so, OK, <laughs> thank you. Um, so you've gone through all these cities and you've walked through them. Did you find a similarity in the formation of the town squares um, when you went from one city to the other? And then when you came back to, to England, were you able to make any comparisons between the places that you've been and, and, and London? I, and, well, to compare the six cities initially, I thought that I, I, I found that the first, the first and the last, so Cairo and Johannesburg, not necessarily because of their extreme locations in, in, my, in my travel, but those two were quite similar. And I felt perhaps there was, um, in those two places, there were quite a lot of urban space, open space for people to gather, or at least people gathered in, in these spaces. So Tahir Square is, a, is an ov obvious example. But then the four cities in between had almost no open space, no public space. And I found that quite, um, quite different, very different, in fact. Um, and I wondered if we take it as such a luxury here in, in our um, London or European setting that we have this open space and we can appropriate it and participate in our own ways. I thought in these four places where this wasn't really um, available to those residents, that there's a missed, something's missed there. Um, but then it also reflects um, how these people interact with each other. It's much more about a shared network amongst people. So the conversations that people have is a lot more uh, disclosed and closed, rather, as opposed to open. And so maybe, that's, maybe that speaks of why open space isn't as, uh, isn't as prevalent across these four places. Um, so I found that Johannesburg and Cairo were in some way similar to London, whereas the other four were very different. And I also spent a lot more time in those four because I found it difficult to, to work into those places as a, as compar as a comparison to the first, the first and the last. Um, yeah. Thank you. I think you actually make a really interesting point about this loss of agency, that if you take people out of these hyper-dense communities, which are actually very demanding to live in in one way, um, and put them in a eight-story condominium with perfect sanitation and so on, that loss of agency issue is actually a political question, isn't it? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, because, um, the, the big cities in China are going through this process now. You know, you drive out of Shanghai in the morning and an entire Hutong neighborhood has disappeared during the afternoon, the same in Beijing and all over. Um, and you know, the miracle provides sanitation and structural stability in 20 floors or 30 floors or whatever. But actually that togetherness of people is eroded. And I think it's, I think there's, there's a, an interesting secondary question 
here about you know, to what extent is resettlement on that kind of scale a political question as well. You know, the, the emptying of that neighbourhood of a quarter of a million people at the base of the city down in Cairo is a very interesting thing. You know, is, that, is that part of the ignition process, what's happening in Cairo today? I don't know, because when that neighbourhood, which was, yes, overcrowded, hugely insanitary, but super vibrant and massively historic, when that wins, somehow the ferments come out somewhere else. I don't know. Uh, it's just, a, it, it, it's a really interesting question. It's, it's, I mean, you see that pattern in Western cities as well, completely yeah. looking at some clearance and resettlement yep. in the modernist style. No, it's, it's, the the, it's the same arguments we rehearsed here in the 50s yeah, yeah, and 60s, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Any more questions? But at the same time, I guess, recycling is getting a bit of a comeback over here with kind of things like packing places for architecture and um, you know, the park, for example, the stuff that's just coming out to get any kind of recycling for each projects. Um, do you think there's anything different about it happening out of choice, I guess, kind of like aesthetic, maybe even ethical kind of decision, as opposed to maybe some people are even seeing it happening where it's kind of born of me, I guess. Yeah. Is there something different that kind of produces different results? Is it any less interesting? Uh, well, I think they're both interesting, but interesting for very different reasons. Um, so as you said, I mean, you, you almost summed it up perfectly yourself, that you have this one example where it's um, a necessity and another example where um, it's quite topical and it's quite um, exciting to take things and remake them and, and, uh, and so I think they're both perhaps independent of each other uh, and, and there isn't perhaps that same crossover. Although I do wonder for example in some of these cities and examples where as their economy continues to punch above its own weight, um, will people then become more disposable and, and this kind of agency that has worked in some way, uh, will that be lost or discarded? Um, and so uh, that, that's, that's interesting to me is, is, is what's the future for these places and where will they be in five years and ten years time? Um, yeah, thanks. There's one other thing. You actually, you're a fearless and intrepid researcher, because actually, the, the, in, in some cases, I, I can imagine you would, you're arriving somewhere you've not been before. I'm sure. Um, it's extremely <coughs> difficult to make sense of it. Yeah. Yeah. Stuff is happening 24/7. It, it doesn't have the. I don't really like the word coherence in some ways that we're used to, uh, particularly in the way we think as architects. And yet you managed to engage with it and form these relationships with people. I thought the camera idea was absolutely brilliant. Um, and I think the photographic results of it are really extraordinary. I mean, it's interesting you mentioned that because uh, I'd always arrive and I'd always look for a map. I, I like plans, I'm you know, an architect. And so, in making, and so, I'd always ask everyone, where can I get this map from? And I'd spend the first three days looking for a map, and there's no map. And so, in the end, that became, and it's a bit like the Excel, it's a bit like the spreadsheet, which I'd initially sort of go through and try to contact people, but actually, just by entering the city, and by being open to the kinds of conversations I have, and, and, uh, and relying on some kind of instinct that I could just get by, and I suppose the most, uh, the most pleasing aspect of this entire journey is that my MacBook Pro came home with me, the Nikon camera came home with me, the iPhone came home with me, and, uh, and everyone's quite surprised by that, yeah. especially my father. <laughs> um, and so, uh, so some of these engagements must have worked quite, quite well. Um, and and uh, yeah, I really had a good time, really enjoyed it. Um, well, I believe the process of architectural education is to produce versatile problem solvers and we have a fabulous example here, Thomas Aquilina. Thanks so much.